Hey, good morning. It is Brother Brett again, and we have another adult Sunday school lesson getting ready to go into the video machine. So this one is designed for Sunday, December the 13th of 2020. It's entitled Conceived, and it's out of Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. You're probably very familiar with this, but we're going to dig in and see what we can learn today and see if Holy Spirit speaks something new to us. If you remember last week, uh, we were in Luke also. We were looking at Gabriel's visit with Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, uh, his announcement of the coming of John, who would be the forerunner of the Messiah. This week, we find the angel Gabriel in a far, far place from Jerusalem. Uh, far distance-wise, not as much, but far as far as regarding the nature of the town. Jerusalem is the hub of Israel. Nazareth is just a sleepy little town, and we find that's where uh, Gabriel is, and he's sharing a message with a young lady about God's amazing plan. So let's read our text, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, then we'll dig into it for just a little bit. It says in the New, New International Version, In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you who are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. So as we dig into this passage, we'll break it up into some sections as we usually do. The first is called, uh, I'm entitling the greeting, and it's in verses 26 uh, through 29. And in verse 26, it starts out and it says, in the sixth month. And you might ask legitimately, what is the sixth month? Is that June? which they didn't have June back then, but uh, is that June? It's talking about the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. This verse comes right after, verse 26, comes right after verses 24 and 25, where Elizabeth is in seclusion. Uh, Zachariah has gotten the message that they're going to have a baby. They're going to name him John, and he's going to be silent until the baby is born. He comes back uh, from his duties at the temple, and Elizabeth becomes pregnant. And she hides herself in seclusion for six months. In the sixth month, and for five months, in the sixth month is when this story takes place, or this encounter takes place. Uh, so it comes when Elizabeth's in seclusion, and just uh, foreshadowing, Elizabeth and Mary are related to each other. Is why that plays a part in that. We'll see in just a minute. Verse 27, it says that this message comes to a virgin pledged to be married to Joseph. Now, last week, our message from Gabriel centered around uh, the angel talking to the dad of John, to Zechariah. This week, uh, it's about the young lady. It's all about the mom. The virgin uh, was pledged to be married, and, that, and her name was Mary. Now, it's important to note that the custom back in that day was that when you were engaged, it was a legal uh, engagement. It was, some, it was a binding thing. So you, it's much like a marriage. You... Uh, had all the commitments and all those kinds of things, but you live separately for usually about a year, uh, and a lot of times these girls were 12 to 14 years old, so it was just kind of a time uh, of, of grooming and making sure they were ready, but it was a legally binding thing, and it, uh, they were not to have sexual relations, but, but they, were to have, they were married in every sense except they didn't live together and have sex together. Um, and then to undo that engagement, you had to have a divorce. So it was that level of legally binding. So that's who this message is coming to, to a young lady who is engaged to a man named Joseph. And 
really all it says in Luke's gospel basically is he was a descendant of David. So that puts Jesus in the line of, of David. So it's really all about mom in, in Luke's gospel anyway. And it says in verse 28, it was Gabriel's greeting. He said, greetings. Let me just read out the scripture. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, Mary was not, and I'll get in trouble for this from somebody, but Mary was not special in and of herself. God didn't pick her because she had uh, some innate qualities. He picked her because he chose her. He chose her for a special task. Her response to that special task makes her very special indeed. Uh, but she was not, she, she was chosen by God and for that test, the favor that rested upon her was God's presence. So that's what it says in verse 28. Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. That is God's favor is when he chooses to be with us, when he comes to uh, abide with us and dwell with us. And he's chosen Mary to do that and to be a very special task and to put uh, the Son of God into her. And so that is kind of where that is. That was the greeting. And Mary was greatly troubled in verse 29. It says, uh, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting is this anyway. And I think that's an understatement that she was greatly troubled. And that word that's translated greatly troubled is only used in this one instance in the Bible. And it means that, that she was stirred up. She was perplexed. She was confused. Her world was turned upside down. And you can understand why that might be the case why she might be confused. An angel shows up, which doesn't happen every day. Even back then, that was not an everyday occurrence. And then she's given this wonderful message, God's favor is upon you, he's with you, but it's unusual. And she's not exactly sure what this means. And she's kind of in, in anticipation of, okay, what is going on here? What is going to happen? So that's, that is the greeting from the angel the next section of our scriptures in verses 30 through 33, and that's the announcement. This is what the angel came to say to Mary. And he starts off with, in verse 30, he says, do not be afraid. He sensed, probably from the look on her face, that she was greatly troubled, that she was perplexed. She didn't know what was going on around her. And he gave her the message, do not be afraid. And if you remember, that's basically the same thing he had to tell Zechariah in last week's lesson. He said, don't be afraid. I know that this is messing you up and it's scary, but listen, just sit and listen. I've got a message for you. And again, he told her in verse 30 that she had found favor with God. And then in verses 31 through 33, we get the big announcement. And it's big for Mary, but it's big for the world uh, as well. So and the announcement is in verse 31, you will be with child and give birth to a son and you're to give his name Jesus. You will be with child and you're going to have a son and you're supposed to call him Jesus. That may or may not have helped her state of being greatly troubled. How is she going to explain this pregnancy? Again, she's engaged to be married to Joseph. They're not allowed to have sexual relations. She's supposed to be uh, chaste and celibate and pure and all those things. How is, it, how is she going to explain the fact she's pregnant? Because you can only hide that for so long. How is she going to explain that? Uh, his name means, Jesus means Yahweh is salvation. That's not comforting me either. That probably didn't comfort her greatly troubled. Then all those other descriptions in verses uh, 32 and 33 probably didn't help either. It says that he, this son that you're going to give birth to, he's going to be great. He's going to be called the son of the most high, God. He's going to be the son of God. He will be the new David. He will take over the throne of his father, David, oh my, this baby I'm going to give birth to is the new David, the new king. He says he's going to reign over Israel forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Can you imagine in Mary's mind what must be stirring? I was greatly troubled at, at the greeting. How much more troubled am I now that you're saying I'm going to have a baby, that his name is going to be Yahweh is, is salvation, that he's going to be the son of the Most High, that he's the new David, he's going to reign forever. I'm 13, 14 years old. I am overwhelmed by all of this. And then in verses 34 and 37, our third point of our outline, Mary asked a very legitimate question. Last week, Zechariah uh, talked, and he, his question wasn't so much how can this be. His question is, prove it to me. I don't believe you. Prove it to me. His was a, a one of doubt. 
Mary's was an honest question that anyone might ask. How can this be because I'm a virgin? Mary was old enough to understand how pregnancy worked and how you got pregnant. And she had not had any of those activities that would lead to that. So where is this son going to come from? How is this possible that I'm going to have a son and you're announcing this, but, I, but I've not been with Joseph. I've not been with any man. How is this possible? And the angel answers the question in verse 35 and says, the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is going to come on you, is going to overshadow you so that this child will be conceived by God and he will be called the Son of God. And again, how overwhelming that must be. But Mary didn't ask for a sign like Zechariah basically did. Uh, Zechariah said, how to how, prove this to me? And then Gabriel said, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. You can't speak until the baby gets here. Mary didn't ask for a sign, but the angel Gabriel gave her a sign anyway. And he, and he referred to Elizabeth that we talked about earlier, who was now six months along or in her sixth month of pregnancy, who was a relative of Mary's and said, Mary, your relative, your cousin, your, and depending on which translation you have, but a, a relative, a close relative, your a relative, Elizabeth, who she would have known, is with child in her old age. So th that is what's going on. She was barren and old, but God is giving her a son, so you can trust that God can do this. And then he ends up in, in verse 37 with a very simple statement, for nothing is impossible with God. That deserves quotes and highlights and excla exclamation points and maybe fireworks going on. Nothing is impossible with God. And then verse 38, as we wrap this up, we have Mary's response. And this is such a beautiful, beautiful. Why was Mary, why is Mary special? Was she special in, the, in and of herself? And that's why God chose her. She is special because this is her response. God called her to a task and this is her answer in verse 38. And this is a great example to all of us of how to respond when God, God calls us to something. Small or large, when God calls us to something, her, her answer was, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you said. In essence, it sounds a whole lot like what Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, Lord, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, could we do it that way? But then he ends up by saying, nevertheless, not my will, but your will, God, be done. Father, let your will be done. That's in essence what Mary is saying. She says, I am the Lord's servant. God, I'm your servant. So whatever you need to do in my life, you do that. So that is a, this, don't you just love this story? I mean, for all the reasons, the beauty of it, Mary's response, uh, the angel coming, the hope that we have in Jesus, uh, all the promises that are involved. It's just a beautiful, marvelous story. It's uplifting. But what should we today in 2020 take away from this? We can get warm fuzzies about it and celebrate our salvation, but is there a deeper message that the Holy Spirit wants to give us through this? Is, is the Holy Spirit trying to stir us to something uh, that we could apply for our daily lives today? A couple things that hit me as I thought through that application part. The first thing is verse 37. Nothing is impossible with God. If God can speak and the whole world comes into existence out of nothing, there's nothing here, God speaks and there it is. If God can do that, if God can put a holy one, the Son of God, into a human through the Holy Spirit, God can handle what's going on in our lives. God can handle the problems that we have. God can handle what he asks us to do. We can, God can handle what, is, what he's stirring in our hearts, those announcements he's making or those things that are, uh, and we are encountering in life that seem impossible, seem overwhelming, seem there's no way to get through this, seem there's no way God can do this. God can do those things. Nothing is impossible with him. He simply asks us to trust him, to trust him. The second thing that I thought through as a, a way to take, what a takeaway might be for this is that God uses humanity, he uses humans, us, to accomplish his plans. He used Mary to be the mother of Jesus. He chose to do that. He could have done it a hundred thousand ways. He chose to use Mary, a human, a virgin, a young lady. He chose to use her to accomplish his plans to bring a Savior. He chose to use Zachariah and Elizabeth to bring about John, the forerunner of Christ. And they were old and shouldn't be having babies, but he chose to do that. He chose to use John 
John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. And he used all those heroes in the Bible. He, he called them, he gave them assignments, he used them for his kingdom's purposes. And he also uses us. That's not just a Bible time thing that God uses humanity. Today, every moment of every day, God calls on us to be a part of his kingdom work, to be a part of his plan. He is calling you and he's calling me this very moment to some task, whether it's a small task, whether it's a large task, whether it's something the same, well, that's not that big of a deal. Why is that important? Because God asked you to do it. Or it's something that seems astronomically hard, but God has asked you to do it. He still uses us in his plan. That is how he works. And we need to be ready to respond. We need to be ready to respond. And that's the third thing that I, that I get as a takeaway from this. Our response to how God calls us is critical. When God calls on us, what is our response going to be? When, not when, as God calls on us. He is calling on us now. What is our response going to be to his call? Are we going to be like Zechariah was last week? How can I know this is right, God? Prove, prove yourself to me. You know, and God did, and Zechariah went ahead and did his thing. But is our first response going to be, God, I'm not sure that I believe you in regard to this. Or maybe we'll have the response that Moses had in the Old Testament uh, Lord, surely you're not asking me to do this. You, use my brother, use my sister, use anybody, but surely somebody is more qualified than I am. Is that going to be our response when God's calling us? Or maybe we could have the response that Mary did. And again, what a beautiful response. I'm your servant. I will do whatever you say. That should be our response when God calls us. Hopefully we will follow Mary's example. I am your servant, Lord. I'm, your, I'm yours. I've been bought with a price. Whatever you ask me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Simple surrender to what God has called us to do. I hope we can do that. It's sometimes easier said than done, but that is God's expectation from us, and he is calling us, and whatever he's asking us to do, he can accomplish because nothing's impossible with him. Let's pray, and then we'll get at the rest of our Sunday uh, sharing Jesus as we go. Let's pray together. Glorious Father, thank you that you have given us this message, this story of how Mary received the news that she would be the mother of Jesus, our Savior. And God, how marvelous and warm and beautiful the story is. But God, even more, how challenging Mary's response to you. And may that be our response every moment of every day as you call us to be a part of your plans, your kingdom work, that Father, we'd simply say, I belong to you. I'll do whatever you ask me to do without hesitation, without arguing, without asking for proof, without trying to pass it on to someone else. God, we would simply say yes to you. What a great and beautiful challenge to go with this great and beautiful story. And we thank you for sharing it with us uh, through your word and through Holy Spirit opening our eyes to it. And we ask all these things in Jesus' beautiful, powerful, wonderful name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.